Great. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm Lisa, and I'm here today with Venkat. Hey, Lisa. I'm Venkat, and I'm here today with my guest, Lisa. Hey, Venkat, are you eating a snack today? Yes. And uh, as we were just talking, I is a very difficult letter of the alphabet to make a snack for, but I am eating idli. So I don't know if you can see my plate, but there are these little rice cakes, uh, steamed rice and then lentil cakes, uh, popular South Indian snack thing. So I managed to get idli for I. What do you have? I have, a, um, I have an ice pop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's like a scuba diver. Ice pop. Yeah, it's pretty tasty. I'm gonna invite us out. Oh yeah, ice cream, ice pop. So there's a lot of icy things uh, you could do with. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it actually. Um, oh, it's good. I just made them this morning. <laughs> we should start putting pictures of our foods and snacks here. Oh, in along the along with the two by two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it didn't occur to me until like five minutes ago. I could have just done ice cream and been done with it. Um, but it's good. You know, it's cool. So it's funny. For I, I actually put your I brain. do Indian food, but then that seemed like a cheat because that's a whole category. You can't do Indian food. You might as well just do food for F, right? So I almost thought of doing food for F or fried food for F. So I think the honest way to play this game is uh, uh, to get as specific as you can and like not you know, screw with the spirit of the letter game. All right, so Idlis and Ice Pops. All right, and we have the two by two today. We so have we a two by two today. So for those of you who um, are tuning in and can't see our two by two, it's a, it's a two-dimensional, is that two-dimensional? Two-dimensional axis. <laughs> um, one is what Lisa knows, or what, yeah, and one is what Venkat knows. Um, so we're gonna rank ourselves. We have a bunch of things to talk about, Venkat. Um, yep. So IQ is the first one right, so, on the list. Yeah. Um, all right. So IQ. So I would say, uh, I guess I know about as much as uh, anybody kind of vaguely following Silicon Valley conversations does. Like, it, yeah, I don't find the topic particularly interesting, but a lot of people in tech find it very interesting. So I would put myself as a medium. Like, I, I know about the Flynn effect and like a couple of like advanced IQ related topics. So I'll put myself as a medium. What about you? IQ is something I've, I've spent more time than I ever thought I would thinking about. Um, so I don't know if that makes me an expert. I don't know much about what the literature says, but I only have my own ideas about IQ. <laughs> that is typical Lisa, making <laughs> up your own stuff. So I'm going to put you at about the same as me. Okay. So we're both in the first quadrant. Um, All cool. Right. Uh, Indoors. Next up is indoors. Um, I am. I am. I know a lot about the indoors right now. Uh, but before pandemic time, were you particularly a homebody, or were you more like can't wait to get out of home kind of person? I have always been a homebody. <laughs> okay, I've been. I think not as much of a homebody. I do like to go out and hang out in coffee shops at least. But I do like spending time at home more so than like, I don't like any typical going out activities that much. So I don't know. So you're, I think you know more than me here, but I'm a fairly indoorsy person. All right. Insight plus innocence. All right. You put that there. I don't know what you mean by that. I did. I, oh, I'm not sure. I do know what, well, okay. So I wanted to talk about insight. Um, yeah, I think that's an interesting access you can make here about, insight and innocence and like, I don't know. Yeah. That's not, I didn't say anything. Um, so you're talking specifically about um, how innocent people or children can sometimes have a lot of insight. Is that the thing you're going for or no? No, I think it's more like what is the relationship between having insights and like considering the level of like, like do insights destroy innocence? Oh, oh, okay. Do insights destroy innocence? Oh, okay. Now, I would call myself an expert on this since half the things I've written are about <laughs> okay. this topic. <laughs> what I, would you? Hope, I was hoping you would say that. Yeah. Um, oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I think I know some things about this. I think I have some insights to offer here. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, Ingratitude. Uh, the next one is in 
Did you put this on there or did I put this on there? I think you did. It does not sound like the top of, sort of topic I would put on. I don't remember. Can we take it off? All right. Let's take it off. Okay. Igloos. Done. Okay. So next is igloo. I think I don't know actually any... went with indoors, right? That goes with indoors. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. But uh, I would, let's actually separate it out and talk about it together. But I know very little about <laughs> igloos. I don't know about you. Do you know much about igloos? I don't know anything about igloos. Did All I right. put this on the list? Did you put this on the list? I don't know. Okay. But it, it's on the list. So let's leave it there. <laughs> it's on the list. All right. All right. So we have it. one more independence. Uh, so um, there's actually a lot on my mind. So let's hit on that last, but I have a lot to say about it since we just launched the Indies uh, Yak Collective. So I want to talk about that. So uh, I would say I know a fair amount about it. I've been an indie freelance kind of person for a long time. So in that sense, I know a lot about it. Uh, what about you? Are we talking about working for yourself independence? I don't know anything about That's that. That's the aspect uh, I'm interested in, but independence broadly. Do you have lots of thoughts on that? Philosophy, liberty, all that stuff? Oh. Oh, yes, I can talk about that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. So we are real experts on the letter I here. So much so that there's not enough room for all our expertise. <laughs> Except for igloos, we know about everything else. There is to know about independence. All right. So that's our two by two. So insight plus innocence, IQ, independence, and indoors. Both Lisa and Venkat mm -hmm. claim they know a lot. And igloos, neither with Lisa or Venkat knows anything about it. So that's our expertise map for the week. All right, let's get started. Great, so I think first on the list was IQ. Are we gonna talk about IQ first? Yes, go for it. I think that's the smart thing to start with. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so have you ever taken, let's start with this. Have you ever taken like an IQ test? Mm. I think you should answer that first. <laughs> um, I think so the answer to this is partly I don't know, um, which I think says something about my intelligence. It's fine. Um, the other, so the last time I tried taking, I was in, I was on, well, I was like on a business trip in 20, at the end of 2017 and I decided for whatever reason I wanted to take an IQ test. I think because I was trying to make, I was trying to like make snide comments about IQ tests and then realized that I didn't really know a lot about IQ, like the Mensa kind of level test. Um, mm -hmm. So I went online and found one and took it. And then I got to the end and it's like, great, we're not actually going to give you a number. We're just going to tell you that you should probably, you know, you're a good candidate to, to like go to an actual Mensa club and take an actual IQ test. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah yeah i think i'd be the same i don't know if i've ever taken a proper iq test but i've taken two so one is online same as you at some point i went online and tried to take an online test but they didn't like um, screw me over that way so they did um, uh, if i give them my email they sent me a number so i did score above 150 hmm. or something like that so that's i think high iq or something and oh that is high I think. But it was like not a full thing. Like it was a quick and dirty thing, maybe a short version or something. But I don't remember. It was somewhere 150, 160, something like that. But I was suspicious of it being a scam. And the other time was in sixth grade. We had um, somebody come in and actually administer a formal test that looking back, I remember as being something like an IQ test because it had all the, you know, verbal, spatial, logical, mathematical, all those usual categories of um, IQ test stuff. But yeah. that did not give me a number, but it gave me a percentile or something. So I was uh, 99 or something, but that was like a small class in my school. So that's not, uh, again, not clear. So I'm going to give myself huge benefit of the doubt and call myself a genius based on my two half-ass tests that I took. I mean, I'm definitely a genius. I don't need a test to tell me that. It's fine. Um, I don't know if I'm a very. I would say I don't know if I'm a very stable genius, but. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Anyway, so like, I can I can talk about like so going back to like oh I decided to take this like, 
IQ tests because I wanted to make fun of IQ tests, um, but needed information. And it ended up taking the test actually gave me a lot of insight into what I felt like an IQ test was testing. Is this the same? Is talking about IQ tests the same as talking about IQ? I think, no, the two are different, right? But I think it's kind of, um, they're related because it, okay, so IQ is strongly tied to personal identity, I think for a lot of people, like yeah. uh, it's important for them to know that they're smart and have like a certificate or a number that says they're smart. So there's that aspect of IQ. And then there is um, the sort of um, objective, um, uh, sort of philosophical scientific perspective on IQ, like, do you believe it and measures anything right? Do you think it is neuro anatomically correct? Or do you think the statistics are done right or whatever? So, you know, the supposedly objective view. But I, the reason I think they're related is every person I know who seems obsessed with IQ and wants to talk about it a lot or discuss it to death or argue about it, they also seem to have a few identity hangups around it. So I personally kind of have this strong suspicion that anybody obsessed enough with IQ to talk about it a lot either is extremely kind of insecure about it, or on the other hand, they're one of those uh, people who score like you know, record levels on it and um, feel kind of like it's not recognized or rewarded enough and develop a deep resentment of it. Like uh, I, I know a few people uh, like this, like who grew up poor or something. And at some point they took like some test in some advanced placement um, school program or something. Mm -hmm. And it detected that they were like off the charts genius, but they also ended up therefore being super troubled and ended up being failed adults. So those two ends of the distribution are, I think the kind uh, I see most obsessed with IQ, like people who are insecure about their intelligence and people who get like a good IQ score, but don't have the life results to show for it. Something like that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, my own opinion is like I've, I'm, I've frankly never been interested in IQ per se. Like I'm broadly interested in like cognition and how the brain works and all that stuff. But IQ seems like a bureaucrat's idea of doing neuroscience. It's never interested me. And despite <laughs> my jokes earlier about I'm sure I'm a genius, I, I don't know. I think if I took an actual test at my peak, if I had taken one, I would have probably come out near the high end, but probably not you know, like towards the genius end or something. So that's probably where I would have landed. And that might explain why I am not actually that interested in the topic, because I don't think I'm like either insecure about it or off the charts enough to have that be a factor in my life. So you're saying you're too mediocre on the chart to like, exactly. Actually, yeah. like... I'm a completely mediocre intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. What about you? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting, so it's like, okay, so I think the thing that's interesting to ask about IQ tests is what are they measuring? Because they're measuring something, right? Like the fact that some people can do well on them and some people can't, it's like, that's a thing, right? Like that's, it's, it's measuring something, um, which is kind of the thing that I got interested in when I took like this one internet IQ test. Um, they didn't tell me what my number, whatever, it told me what I got wrong, which is fine. I got some things Okay, so wrong. you said earlier that you have ideas about it and even, even though you haven't like looked at the literature and stuff. So I, I, I'm a little bit familiar with sort of the history and literature around it, mm -hmm. um, mainly because I was interested in artificial intelligence and there's a link there. Uh, but yeah, let's hear your sort mm -hmm. of um, folk theories and ideas about IQ. Not a folk theory. It's a nifty okay. theory. Um, nifty theory. There we go. <laughs> Um, oh, so like, okay, so the conclusion that I reached after taking like a 30 question IQ test is that um, to some extent, so well, there's two things. Um, the first thing is that for a long time, I, one thing that I've always been told around IQ is that it's innate and that you can't change it. I think that's completely wrong. Um, it's 100% wrong. Like, I wish I had like before and after numbers for certain periods of my life because I'm like, there's no way I could have answered this question like five years ago. And now it's like very easy to find the answer because it was just like number trick things. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I definitely think that there's like an experience and component of IQ tests, which is interesting. So like- Wait, yeah. wait, wait. Um, you're aware that IQ is age normalized, right? No. Did you know that? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know anything so about IQ. totally wrong about that. So the number, <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, all right. So this is actually something you should know. So if I recall correctly, IQ is a measure of your deviation from an age normalized sort of distribution of um, the intelligence test. So for example, yeah, I think 100 is the normal. So if you're 100, it means you're average for your age or something. But 120 means you're like 20 points ahead of like the average for that age. So the fact that you were able to solve the problems better five years later doesn't say much until you compare with other people who had that same before and after of it separated by five years. So all I, right, you're off to a good start here. I'm to a great start, <laughs> Venkat. Um, but hey, I mean, at least to me, it meant I could learn things over five years. So personally, it meant something. Um, <laughs> the other thing, like the, <laughs> the, um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting is that, so I think what I think that what I think, what I think it was measuring is your ability to um, identify patterns. Um, it was like the whole thing was pattern recognition. And it was like, can you figure out the X thing in this series? Like it's, it's all hundred percent like pattern recognition. So it's like, okay, that becomes like, an, so that actually becomes an interesting question. I think that that actually says interesting things about like the tasks that we ask AIs to do. Um, Cause a lot of like the, Oh, classify this picture is pattern recognition. Right. So a lot of like, it's like, so like, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's like, oh, this is like a human test for pattern recognition. Um, and like, and then it's like, you can kind of like find, look at interesting things around that. That's like, oh, so, okay. What is involved in pattern recognition? Well, the first step of finding a pattern is, um, is observing detail, right? So if you can't observe details and notice what the differences are, it's impossible to pick up on the pattern. So mm -hmm. like, I don't know. So those were the, I guess that's not like a whole lot, but those were the, the few things that like from this one IQ test is like, oh, so it's just like pattern recognition. And the first thing that you need in order to become better at pattern recognition is to get better at um, detail. So better at observing like small things because without all of that detail noticing, uh -huh. you can't actually build a pattern because you're not seeing the underlying like reality as it is. Um, so observation is important for um, intelligence because it allows you to collect the information that you need in order to build better recognition of the patterns that are going on. So I think um, you're kind of, um, you wandered off into, I think an adjacent really deep topic about how the brain kind of like turns observations into patterns to like, you know, right and left brain stuff. So that's, that's almost a whole different topic that's adjacent to intelligence. Uh, but, I, but I think you're right about that. Uh, but to fit what you were saying earlier, like, um, so here's my understanding of IQ. So I'm kind of interested in sort of the historical evolution of IQ as a measure and how it came to be. So mm -hmm. historically, it actually started out as a way of uh, measuring aptitude for doing bureaucratic work, honestly. Like it was one of its first major uses where it was uh, recruiting people into the army and sort of grading them into particular roles in the army and so forth. And um, so the interesting thing there is what it measures is originally historically, what it was intended to measure was not something about the brain or about humans or about how they fit into society or about thinking at all, but how well they fit into the needs of a particular kind of organization, which was historically from like, you know, German bureaucracies or whatever. And so that, that's one thing to note. The other thing to note is AI and IQ are kind of like um, separated at birth twins because if you look at AI, AI actually is not artificial intelligence. It's almost like artificial IQ because the original formulations of AI were actually tracking the exact same kinds of pattern recognition tasks and stuff that uh, uh, went into IQ tests. So it's like, both of these were separated at birth, sort of twin conceptions of, um, I don't know, procedural competence derived from the needs of bureaucratic institutions. So 19th century German bureaucracies, 1940s American military bureaucracies, they had certain needs for certain kinds of tasks being done. And that led both to the original specifications of what IQs should be good at and what AI should be good at. So that's the historical piece. And I think there's a lot of criticism, of course, like, is it relative to Western culture and spatial linguistic um, forms? Is it uh, particularly gendered? Is it, uh, uh, so lots of criticisms that were kind of like at a statistical social level, but I don't think it became the hypothesis that it actually measures something about the brain 
I suspect it came much later. Like it, it got refined in the 50s or 60s when they started taking that the factor G. So uh, when you look at the statistics of how they do IQ, the reason they claim that it doesn't change after normalizing for age and stuff is that they, the, the statistical analysis comes out in a certain way that one way to interpret it is to claim that there's a factor G, this lowercase letter G, we just went G, right? G H I, yeah. But lowercase letter G for general mm -hmm. factor that they claim is a measure of general intelligence. And that's the basis for claiming all the big things about IQ that even though you're measuring these five or six very narrow pattern recognition capabilities, the fact that you do well on that is supposedly an indicator that you'll do well in all kinds of general intelligence tasks. And what is claimed as a success factor is Oh yeah, people up to a point, higher IQ leads to better life consequences and income or whatever, but only up to a point. And so I have like several levels of disagreement with that whole sort of model of IQ. I think the statistical analysis that leads to identifying G as like a meaningful factor of neuroanatomy is bullshit. I also think that modern neuroscience doesn't actually support the idea of like a very general kind of uh, G factor for intelligence. It's a statistical artifact. I think if you look at how neuroscience works, you can have like multiple other interpretations of how the brain works. And there was, in the eighties, there was a guy named Howard Gardner who wrote a theory and book called multiple intelligences, where he tried to like reframe the IQ idea into an MI idea. And he talked about like, all right, we have six different kinds of intelligence. And then Daniel Goleman did emotional intelligence that got called EQ. So there's, there's yeah. basically a lot of room for like, I don't know. It's not even cr criticism. Like it's uh, honestly, I think IQ is not very much better than astrology or Myers Briggs or some of those other things we talked about. It's only mildly better. It's got a lot of like statistical bullshit thrown on top of it. And some of it, if you squint a little, looks like it's persuasive evidence of like general intelligence, but that argument can be critiqued. So basically I think, uh, IQ, so my summary position is IQ measures the needs of 19th century German bureaucracies. That's my view. It doesn't measure anything meaningful. It, it says nothing about the brain. It's not a useful lens for looking at cognition or the brain. Anyway, that's my little rant about IQ. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting to hear you say about this G thing because so just to briefly um, kind of go back to the thing you're saying about like, so AI, there's like, so in AI research, they talk a lot about like finding generalized intelligence. Um, I bet that's, they probably got that from the G, right? Like the G factor in IQ is where that term comes from as like generalized, being a generalized quotient. Fascinating. Okay. Interesting. You know, it's, oh, so one, one other small thing is it's interesting to hear you talk about the German stuff. So what got me into the IQ things, I think was, Partly the I read Michael Lewis's book on um, Kahneman and Tversky. Um, can't remember the name of the book, yeah. but predictably, um, no, that's the yeah, uh, thinking fast and slow or predictably. Thinking rational. fast and slow is Kahneman's book, but Michael Lewis wrote a book about their partnership, and he explained like the history oh, okay. behind like like kind of like just their history. And um, Kahneman got his start trying to design basically the equivalent of an IQ test, but for the Israeli army. Yep. And that was prospect theory, right? That was all the ways in which IQ is like modified by biases and stuff. So um, that's a whole other track yeah. we should talk about sometime. So you've got this idea of like basic intelligence, then you've got uh, Herbert Simon in the 60s and AI pioneer and coming up with the concept of bounded intelligence, so bounded rationality. And he did a lot of work in economics of um, bounded rationality. And then we had biased rationality, uh, which is like, all right, you have intelligence that's not just not general or bounded. It's also biased in all these ways. Then you have multiple intelligences and then you have emotional intelligences. Yep. And if you look at all these like epicycles, people keep throwing on top of like the basic idea of intelligence. By the time you hit the early 2000s, you have this like Jenga tower of like eight layers of theorizing and uh, modeling. And it's like, what the hell are you doing? Like maybe intelligence is not actually a foundationally good concept to build on. And it's historically, if you look at like, the term intelligence, the way we use it now, it's pretty unique to industrial modernity. Like if you look at like, I don't know, medieval or ancient writings, people talk about uh, people being wise or cunning or uh, thoughtful or, you know, they, 
they use like a huge universe of verbal descriptors of uh, cognitive capacity. They don't uh, sort of uh, try to make it, um, they don't try to reduce it to intelligence as one thing. So uh, that, that part annoys me. But, but there is something there. I mean, uh, so I think IQ is bullshit, but I don't think psychometrics, the idea that you should be measuring the brain and its capacities, I don't think that's bullshit. So there's an empirical science of measuring what the brain is capable of that I think might be valuable. So here's a controversial one for you to react to. One of the more robust things I've seen from um, intelligence studies is uh, the idea that uh, women in general have a weaker spatial cognition in particular. So things like rotating objects in their heads and stuff. And one piece of evidence for that is um, uh, out of University of Pennsylvania, I think. So this was an engineering 101 course taught by a couple of uh, women professors. And they mm -hmm. saw that women's engineering students were systematically falling behind male students in specifically the uh, drawing and engineering drawing spatial visualization classes. And they came up with an intervention of uh, teaching women engineer students slightly differently and the great disparity vanished. So it ended up being like an artifact of teaching methods. So I still don't know what to make of that. Clearly there's a gender difference, but clearly it's not that substantial if changing teaching methods just makes it go away. But clearly there's something there that um, you know, fits somewhere in the IQ discussion. But yeah, you're a woman in tech. Unfortunately, that makes you the token person who has to react to things like this. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, uh, I feel like I'm the wrong woman in tech to ask this about because I have been like pretty good spatial awareness. Um, I don't know why. I'm, I, I don't know why. I, I don't know. Um, I think that like you, so I think, I think you went back to kind of one of the things that I think is really important that people hear and it's a message that people hear a lot is that if there is something you're not good at, like it's not easy, but you can probably fix it. And part of fixing the problem is finding someone who is like good at one, recognizing it's a problem. And then two has the capacity or like intelligence to figure out a smart way to teach it to you. So I think that like good teachers, good teachers are worth a lot, like because they can help you figure out and bridge those gaps. Um, yeah. So that yeah. brings up the another thing. can of worms, which is, uh, I think, one of the things that fell in the whole rep uh, reproducibility crisis in the last 10 years is the idea of uh, learning styles. So learning styles was this sort of hugely influential pedagogical theory in the last 20 years where people thought there are like five different learning styles, blah, blah, blah. And the whole thing didn't replicate and it fell apart. But I think there's something there because I do think but that's not what I'm talking about. I don't I don't, so I'm not, I don't think I'm talking about learning style. I think I'm talking about like teachers that actually understand like pedagogy and like actually okay. understand how to construct like on ramps to learning stuff, um, which is like completely different than are you like a visual learner or are you an auditory learner? Um, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I don't, I, that's so funny. It's funny. Worms there. Yeah, I, I never actually paid very much attention to that. I never like, it was never something that I felt like I needed to sit down and figure out, oh, am I an auditory or visual learner? Like, and then yeah, I feel like this It's a good came... thing. You didn't waste your time. It's bullshit. <laughs> I didn't waste my time with it. But yeah. I had friends in college that would be like, oh, I am a X, Y, Z learner. Like I need X. And I'm like, one, how do you know that? And two, okay, cool. Like, all right. I don't know. Great. So there's a video or not. I don't. Yeah. And it makes, uh, it puts you into, uh, what's that, uh, the mindsets woman, um, I forget her name, but uh, the growth mindset versus fixed mindset, it puts you into a fixed mindset. Like if you think there's such a thing yeah. as a visual style, and then there's a heavily visual subject, like, you know, architecture or mechanical engineering or <laughs> art, then you've kind of like shot yourself in the foot and sort of given yourself an excuse for not even trying to learn it. It's like, I'm not a visual person. So a subject that's fundamentally visual, I'm not even going to approach it. But I think the UPenn thing, I'll, I'll dig up a link and send it to you later. That was not about like spatial learning style or something. They did something else different. So I, it's more in the category of going the other way. The idea that um, in grade school, uh, boys tend to be more restless and have um, greater susceptibility to ADHD. So if they're allowed to move around, their learning and retention improves a lot. So making them sit still in one place makes their learning very poor and giving them some freedom to move around. So this is another study I saw. It apparently improves learning outcome for young boys. Instead of giving them Ritalin, just let them run around a bit. I, I don't know how true this is either. That's <laughs> incredible how that works to solve the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. 
All right. Have we beaten the topic of IQ to death? Uh, I don't think it's dead yet, thank God, but um, we should probably move on anyway. Um, uh, what's, what's next? What's next? Let's see. Insight plus innocence. Let's do insight plus innocence. Which is actually like a good, I feel like this is something that you were sort of earlier in our discussion, we're kind of like veering down the pathway that I think leans to insight. Um, when I was talking about like, you know, so it's like, okay, so, so maybe if we like kind of go back to what I was talking about earlier about like my understanding of what IQ is attempting to measure is ability to observe and then like pick patterns out of your observations. Um, which like, so to one sense, so in one sense, like insight is exactly that, right? It's like seeing, um, it's observing a bunch of things and then all of a sudden having this like vision of what, I don't know, a vision of how thing, what all these things mean exactly. Um, and then that's your insight. You see it. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's a good definition of insight. Like, uh, have you ever seen those, uh little optical illusions where it's not clear what you're looking at, but then suddenly it sort of snaps together and you see it like the the famous illusion of the young girl, old woman, right? So when you first look at the young girl, Mm -hmm. old woman illusion, you might see just the young girl and you kind of like, where's the old woman? I can't see it. I can't see it. And then at some point you realize the young woman's ear is the old woman's nose or something like that. I can't remember how it works or chin or jaw. Yeah. The young woman's jaw is the old woman's nose. And then the picture flips and suddenly you see it that way. And that's, kind of the moment of uh, insight. So I think that's a good uh, understanding of insight. Uh, Yeah, but uh, okay, you put the two terms together, I think, insight and innocence, and it's like loss of innocence um, through insight. So uh, where were you going with that idea? Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm gonna have to like, hang on, I have to like think about this for a second, because there was a thread there. Um, I think it has to do with like, okay, so so if, if, well, I mean, it's, I think like part of it depends on how you define like innocence, right? Like, so if innocence is just some way like this inability to like, or like, I guess you can like frame like people who haven't been able to like, okay, so like, have you heard of the, um, the red pill, blue pill? Um, yeah. uh, I think I was this going is, to bring I, that up. Exactly. Okay. So red pill, blue pill is a good metaphor for um, loss of innocence through insight right so right yeah. exactly yes okay so i think that's basically kind of like the the like archetype that i wanted to like encapsulate here um is that like the there's this thing where like you see the world one way and because you haven't been able to see it this other way you're able to like persist in this like understanding of the world that doesn't include this like nasty underbelly or like maybe like would change the way that you see so your world hasn't your worldview hasn't been changed in such a way that you can see um kind of these like rough edges or like i don't know dark side to people human intentions i think um yeah so like the loss of innocence is like a, a certain amount of gaining insight as to the um and that like in a lot loss of innocence is gaining of insight into like maybe some of like motivations for why people do things or um not being yeah i think that's a good definition so loss of insight uh, loss of innocence as gaining of insight into motivations of behaviors and stuff right uh yeah uh, but uh, the the interesting thing about the blue pill red pill metaphor is the the way it sort of evolved um in recent history right in the matrix it meant one thing and uh, by the time it ended up becoming sort of the core trope of the men's rights or manosphere crowd, it, it ended up meaning something entirely different. And I found it really ironic that later the um, makers of the Matrix movie, the Wachowski brothers, became the Wachowski sisters. And um, if you look at the men's rights movement who love this red pill, blue pill metaphor, one of the things they hate is like... Um, um, transgender kind of stuff. So <laughs> there's a whole interesting history there. But the basic metaphor, I think, um, is getting away from the co-option by the manosphere stuff. I think the general metaphor is actually a good one. Um, blue pill is a state of innocence. But red pill, I wouldn't say 
it's it's definitely a loss of innocence, but it's not entirely a gain of insight because what's happening is you're in a blue pill state. You're concerned about like some things don't seem right about the world. And then you get an explanation that gives you a sense of, aha, this is why I've been feeling uncomfortable about something is not right with the world. That's my red pill. And now I know the truth and you don't. And you feel like you're superior to everybody who's still in that false consciousness. But um, one of the uh, things you notice is there's multiple red pills. Like there's people who get red pilled out of like, you know, standard normie life on the left and they become like diehard, like lefty communists. That's one kind of red pill. And then there's people who get super conservative and that's another kind of red pill. So they both can't be true at a time. And my sort of takeaway from that is if you actually track people as they progress through more and more insight and um, things, and they see more than one red pill, they start to blend together and you start to be able to see the world through like multiple lenses. So it's not that there's only one set of motivations and behaviors that explain people. So you have like six different red pills and together they form like a gray pill or something. I think I wrote about this once. So six red pills make one gray pill or something. And that's the true, uh, so that's, so that's the true loss of innocence and gain of insight. When you get to, when you get not to the red pill state, but to the gray pill state, that's when you're at insight. What pill color stage do you think you're at right now, Venkat? I, I don't use this. Um, this metaphor is one I sell to other people, not to myself. <laughs> you should take your own medicine. Like. Uh, I mean, this is like so overused at this point. Like, uh, what's his name? Um, Mencius Moldbug, the NRX guy. He wrote that uh, long three essays called The Clear Pill. Uh, then there's uh, people who talk about the black pill, the purple pill. It's like, all right. I'm done with pills now. Let's move on to a different metaphor. Uh, but <laughs> Moving on then. All right. Like, uh... No, no there's, uh, but, but I mean, there's ways to talk about insight and innocence that don't rely on the pill metaphor. And one I like is actually uh, meditation, right? Uh, like the English term for uh, Vipassana is insight meditation. I forget who came up with that term. Was it John Kabat-Zinn or something? Anyway, so insight meditation, and there's a reason they call it that, uh, which is um, that particular style of meditation, it's about trying to see reality as it really is. So going back to your point about observation, like if you're able to like just, it's not stoicism so much, it's more like, all right, can you just be present in a situation without trying to retreat to it, retreat to some other sort of uh, mental escape zone or trying to like theorize it or model it or fit it to your existing worldview? Can you just be in a situation and sort of just observe it without sort of either being attached to it or uh, pushing it away? So just sort of holding it, the thought and examining it and letting it go. So that's my understanding of um, uh, Vipassana and insight meditation. I've only tried it a couple of times, but that's, I think, a very good alternative way to think about insight and loss of innocence that's not based on the pill metaphor. Because the problem with the pill metaphor is I think that it relies a lot on like conceptual scaffolding. Like, you know, you get the red pill if you read Karl Marx and you learn about the false consciousness of the bourgeoisie. So that's a, a one way to lose innocence. Whereas insight meditation would be more like, all right, you get uncomfortable if you walk through a slum or a region with lots of poor, ugly, starving people who look miserable. So the insight meditation approach to that would be, go be present in that situation sort of just notice your aversion and disgust response or your compassion response or whatever it is you're feeling. And you just stay with that feeling and wait for that experience to sort of become real to you and pop in a way that feels like insight. So it's, it's I think, a gentler notion of insight. It's not the aha experience of enlightenment insight. It's more sort of slowly bringing your consciousness to being present in a situation and allowing it to kind of like soak into the situation. That, that's kind of how I, so I, I've come to prefer that understanding of insight and loss of innocence. So it's like the innocent state in that case would be if you're a rich middle-class person, you retreat from poverty and ugliness and you, that's, that's a state of innocence. And then the loss of innocence would be, you can actually be present around misery and destitution and poverty and not, you know, have either a disgust response or a compassion response, but just stay with the experience. So that's the, the one I prefer now. 
<laughs> like, I feel like the metaphor I want to make for that, like the, I want to take that and be like, yeah, you can be a woman in tech and not feel completely out of place hanging out with all these guys. It's totally possible. You just have to like learn how to like have the meditative insight that you need to survive in that environment. Exactly. Yes. So give us an example of that the insight into um, the tech world and bro tech world from, I don't know, being present there. Uh, I think we should move on to the next topic thing. <laughs> like... All right. Uncomfortable reasons. <laughs> okay. We'll get, we'll flip back to that some other time. <laughs> like, yeah, I've been talking way too much this episode. Let's, uh, so you pick the next topic. Um, should we talk about igloos? I feel like and indoors. Talk- yeah, let's talk igloos and indoors. Okay, I was like, I feel like we should talk about this topic none of us know, neither of us know anything about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do it. Igloos, but you paired it with indoors, which we both seem quite experienced at. Um, I guess an igloo is a form of building an indoors, but out of ice. <laughs> yeah. Um, I read this book recently. I think I mentioned it before. The uh, Starship and the Canoe about the uh, Dyson family, uh, George Dyson and Freeman Dyson. So Freeman Dyson spent um, a decade exploring the Pacific Northwest and Alaska and those regions and got to know Native American cultures really well. And I think at some point he builds an igloo or something. But um, if I recall correctly, the Alaskan Natives didn't actually live in igloos so much as they built it while out on hunting expeditions or something. But apparently they don't live in mm-hmm. igloos anymore. They might occasionally do it for, I don't know, ceremonial or hunting purposes, but they now live in uh, prefab cabins and stuff. And the only people who do igloos are ethnographers trying to experience it. <laughs> I've exhausted my knowledge of igloos at this point. Oh, the things I know about igloos are that you cut blocks out of ice and snow and snack them together. That would be, yeah. that's not super interesting, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But we should talk about like, so indoors. I mean, but so, okay, so the construction of like an igloo as a space though is, so it's kind of interesting if you look at it from the perspective that it's people who live out, you know, it's like construction, it's the construction of an indoors, right? Like yep. Um, yep. a space that humans spend time in to get away from the out of doors, right? So like we definitely have this, um, mm-hmm. there's definitely like this duality that I think is, very universal across all cultures of indoors versus outdoors. Um, in fact, like, yeah. Um, I think that like, so, that, like uh, I'm going to challenge your definition straight up using your own favorite author, Hannah Arendt. Like if you oh, look yeah. at the human condition, she actually flips that. It's not the indoors that's constructed. It's actually the sort of public. So the public is sort of constructed with a set mm-hmm. of laws that preserve freedoms. And the indoors is where you're kind of like faced with all the, you know, provisions of privacy and all the constraints of nature of having to like live and eat and be clean and stuff. So she, she has an inverted definition of the indoors, I think, but the domesticity. So I'm, I'm conflating, I'm conflating the indoors and domesticity. They're not the same thing. Right. Right. More thoughts. Let's hear your rant about the indoors. Rant about the indoors. Well, I mean, so, okay. So I think the first time I really, well, I think this is more inside or outside. So I think that this kind of gets more into what you were talking about with the domestic sphere. But um, when I was in, one thing that I learned or was really interesting to like observe in Brazil, at least like we talked about it in class, um, was this, they definitely had this strong delineation between like the street and the house. So there was this like strong separation between your house was like safe and up away out of the street and like public life was the street and the house was not. Um, And it was like, I don't know if it was like written into the literature or maybe it was just this one class that I happened to take. And that was like the thing that I felt like was being really highlighted. But um, what made it really, but like what really kind of drove it home that like living, experiencing Brazil is that Brazil, like the cities I lived in, the houses all had defenses against the outside, like against the non-domestic like realm. So like there's like barbed wire everywhere. 
and like glass shards shards of glass built into the walls that surround the apartment complexes and you had like gatemen who like kept outsiders out of your like they were there to like if you ever ran into a problem and you were on a street that like had doormen, you knew that you were kind of protected because there were like doormen there. And that's what they were for is to like be eyes on the street when shit went down. Um, like so It's a very defensive notion of constructing the boundary between indoors and outdoors. So uh, whereas America seems very different. So America is more like you're showcasing your private life and showing it off to your neighbors, right? Not so much defending. Well, like in America, I think like I don't feel like I had this same consciousness of the like violent difference between safe indoors and like out in the world on the street um, that I like really felt was like more tangible just being in Brazil, um, which has been, I don't know, but like being, I feel like I feel like America, like, especially with quarantine, I feel like quarantine more than anything is really bringing that same similar dynamic to safe inside, dangerous outside, um, kind of like to our national consciousness for like maybe the first time. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the threat in Brazil, like the outside, the outside representing threats. Um, so you're safe inside, but like outside in Brazil, it was violence. There's just, there's just violence. Like Brazil's a very violent place. Um, and the like, physical danger was just a thing that probably would happen to you if you left your house. Um, whereas here, like now in America, it's not physical violence that we have really ever as a nation grappled with in the same way that I think Brazil does. Um, but like more just this like hidden virus that like might get you sick. Though not everyone seems to be grappling with it, I think, in the same way. Um, not everybody is, uh, but I think there is an equivalent of that in the U.S. as well, except the boundary that's policed as the boundary between safe and not safe is the neighborhood rather than the individual house, right? right. In the U.S., it's like there's the boundary between the good neighborhood and the bad neighborhood, right and wrong side of the tracks. It, it ends up being the kind of like nasty stuff you see around kids being bust in or being driven into nicer neighborhoods to go trick or treating. And that creates all sorts of like um, weird dynamics, school district politics. So I think Americans define the safe, unsafe boundary around basically class defined neighborhoods. Whereas Brazil, from what you're saying, sounds like it's kind of a little bit more mixed. So you kind of have to defend a much tighter perimeter and um, though I'm sure there are rich neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods in Brazil, but still it's a, it's a larger, poorer, more unequal kind of uh, country. So India is kind of the same way. Like there's more middle-classy towns where neighborhood level perimeters are defended, but then larger towns mm -hmm. where slums and rich neighborhoods are next to each other, where houses and individual apartments are defended. So it's almost a question of where you draw the boundary. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that um, connecting to the Hannah Arendt definition, the home is always kind of like the same amount of safe, but its relationship to the outside is what changes, right? So mm -hmm. presumably in classical Athens, it was a civilized city and uh, uh, outside the house meant being in the public square where uh, you know things were safe and you could be free and uh, participate in politics, whereas outside the house in Brazil, modern Brazil, means you might be mugged or uh, robbed or something. So it's like the home always remains a stable zone of safety, but it can be more or less fun to be in depending on the outside. So classical Greece, they might have found the home as like an oppressive environment and you want to go outside and be in the public square with your other senator buddies to have fun. Whereas in right now, home is the place you want to be. You don't want to be too much outside. Hmm. It's interesting to hear you say this thing about like, I don't know. So I kind of have this like, I was trying to think like, when do I ever go out in public? I mean, recently, not physically very much at all. Um, I guess like, I think about it. I think that like, I prefer to hang out in private spaces. Um, and I feel like that, I feel like that tendency, at least for me personally, like I, you can almost like say that like online, I know it seems weird because I have a Twitter and I tweet all the time, but like my Twitter still feels like very private. Um, yeah. 
we should definitely talk about that under T for Twitter. <laughs> Your Twitter is honestly one of the most fun Twitters I've ever seen because you don't get that much engagement and part of the time it sounds like you're talking to yourself in an indoor space but uh, when you do end up talking to people it's like i don't know eavesdropping on a fun little private conversation so it's it's a very fun way to run a twitter like as an you, indoors right as and an it indoors covers, yeah conversations that i have on twitter feel very indoors and yeah if you like if you start talking to me it's like you wandered into my house and like we're yeah. having a conversation exactly um, but that's because like, I think I'm the opposite, like uh, partly because I have like things to promote in a blog and links to boost. I end up kind of acting in a much more public way, at least on my main Twitter. Yeah. And I think I, I remember, I think I interacted with you at one point around this. I don't remember when it was a while ago, but you did, you like posted something and I think I DM'd you and was like, like very just kind of like confused about why you were doing the thing that you were doing and I had to I think it had to do with this like I think it had to do with this like different ways that you would like were just clearly talking to 10,000 people and that was very confusing to me I was like why are you oh I remember this you were asking me why I was boosting somebody else's link or something and was I expecting something in return or what did the person ask me to and I was like no nah, I'm just randomly boosting it because I think it deserves more spotlight oh, yes, you and you were like that. why would you do that yeah. Yeah. I was like, is this your friend that you're promoting? And you're like, no, I just think it's cool and the world needs to know about it. And I was <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, uh, I think that speaks to like indoor behaviors versus outdoor behaviors. Like outdoors, once you realize that you're modeling your behavior as an outdoor behavior, you start behaving differently, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. Right, we have three minutes left uh, before I have to stop. So what topic can we cover in three minutes? What's left, Venkat? We have independence. Can you cover independence in three minutes? Oh, I can shield something I'm part of for uh, 30 seconds and then we can talk about something else in two and a half minutes. Oh, so uh, for those who haven't been following me on Twitter, we started this thing called the Yak Collective. And it's a sort of network of um, independent consultants, contra contractors and stuff like that. So indies of any sort and so i'm having a lot of fun it's um, it's the most ambitious kind of community building i've tried ever like previously anything i've built has had no purpose it's like just people hanging out and shit posting together this is the first time we're trying to do something where the purpose is oh let's see if we can actually drum up more gigs and work for each other so it's kind of mission oriented so that's a new experience for me but yeah that's my shilling of an indie thing our independent person's collective the yak collective okay but then cat if you're all working together and it's a collective can you still call it independent that's an interesting question that's one of the challenges we're navigating because the moment you have multiple people trying to coordinate you have to ask all right so what makes you different from paycheck people in an organization listening to a manager or having a boss tell them what to do right so uh, we are trying to like um, look at previous models of um, network based sort of opt in voluntary coordination, seeing if you can actually organize in fundamentally different ways where you get kind of get to eat your cake and have it too, which is like have the benefits of organizing in larger teams so that you can do more ambitious things. So like open source projects and stuff, but you want to also do that while everybody's kind of basically their own master. So you join a pre project. If you feel like it, you stay with it while, it's going the way you want to. And when it stops being fun, you leave. So it's, it's, it doesn't have the same pattern of mutual commitment that um, paycheck organizations do. So in that sense, it's a way to trade off independence and uh, benefits of collectivism, I guess. Sounds like anarchy. Yeah, we to, hopefully it is a little bit like anarchy. Like the, the good kind of anarchy, the kind that, you know, Ursula Le Guin and others write about in their novels. So not like mm. violent chaos and killing each other. Have so, you spent any time studying anarchist collectives? Uh, no, I think I read a little bit of like the original 1920s anarchist uh, manifesto or something. I got bored by it. Uh, but the closest I've come to reading anything about anarchist theory and literature is... Uh, James Scott seeing like a state, he's got like an anarchist bent to everything he writes. Yeah, James Scott is uh, uh, an anarchist philosopher if you do, if I read properly. He's actually, he's a, he, one of his other books is what, Two Cheers for something, something. And the subtitle is The Art of Not Being Governed. Mm -hmm. So that's James Scott on anarchy. So yeah, he is an anarchist okay. political scientist fundamentally. 
but uh, that and Ursula Le Guin's novels, that's the limit of my knowledge of anarchy. Are you into anarchy a lot? Are you an anarchist? I don't know is the answer, I think, that I'm going to give to that. I don't know. I read a lot of David Graeber's stuff. Yeah, he's sort of more left anarchist. He's a leftist anarchist, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would put James Scott somewhere in the middle and then there's the right anarchist and you're in that world too. Like Bitcoin and beef um, libertarian crowd is like right anarchist. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> yeah. And then, then at some point we should talk about anarcho-capitalism. And oh, we should yeah. definitely yeah. talk about anarcho-capitalism, but that's A. All right, great. Well, that's our show. Great. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Venkat, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Hey, Lisa. Always a pleasure having you on the show. All right. <laughs> All right. See you take care. Next time. Bye. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.